And this stuff right here smells fabulous. What's up, Lazy Dog fam? I hope everybody out there is having an awesome day. We got a busy afternoon playing in the garden again. We need to trellis at least one row of our peppers. So we're gonna show you how we do the Florida weave on our peppers and probably gonna put some straw around those as well. Then we need to check on our soft neck garlic. I think I got one row of it that is either ready to harvest or close to being ready to harvest. And then we're gonna talk about our fig trees. I know a lot of you have been asking, wondering when we were gonna have these things for sale. And I've got a really important update I'm gonna share with you towards the end of the video. So let's start off here in our eggplant pepper and mostly determinate tomato plot. This blank space right here is gonna be filled soon. I've got some tomato plants in the greenhouse ready to go, some more indeterminate varieties that we're gonna be trying for the first time. Let's start out over here. I know I keep talking about this, but man, these determinate tomatoes are growing so fast. And looks like we're ready for a third line of string on our Florida weave trellis here. Now we're not gonna add that today, but I'll probably add it very soon. I swear these things are growing probably anywhere from three to four to five inches a day, it seems like. We've got these cherry tomatoes here, the Torangina variety. We need to do a little maintenance on them in a minute. But our peppers right here, Although they don't look very tall, they're tall enough to go ahead and set up our Florida weave. So I don't know that we're gonna do both rows today. Some of those on that second row are still a little small. I think all these right here can be trellised. We're starting to get some blooms on there. And so even though some of these plants are only six to eight inches tall, when they're that small and they get a pepper on them, it can really load them down and they can go from standing up to laying on the ground real quick like. So when we start seeing blooms, we know we gotta add some supports. And that's especially the case with these bell peppers here and these other sweet peppers at the beginning of the row. Now these things are about a foot tall and got blooms all over them, so they need some support real soon. But before we set up our trellis, these few little weeds in here are bothering me. So I'm gonna take my little single tine and go through here and just kind of scratch the surface there. I got drip tape buried there, so I gotta make sure not to get into that. We're just gonna go through here and get rid of all these weeds before we do the weave. All right, so we got that cleaned up there along the road. Now we need to put our T-post in place. So we're gonna kind of do the same thing we did with our determinate tomatoes over there. Gonna use those five foot T-posts, put them in the ground about a foot deep. And I'm gonna do four plants between each set of posts. So for this row here, I'm gonna need five teak posts. All right, so we got those teak posts in the ground about halfway to China. And it just so worked out that we only have three plants between these two posts on the end. But everywhere else along the row, we've got four plants between each set of posts. And I should mention that the metal T posts aren't as absolutely necessary on peppers as they are those determinate tomatoes back there. So those determinate tomatoes produce a lot more foliage and the fruits are obviously a lot more heavier than peppers are. With these peppers, I've gotten by plenty of times using wooden stakes. So if you can get wooden stakes cheaper than T-posts, go with wooden stakes. It'll work just fine. If you are using wooden stakes, I would advise putting one every two plants as opposed to with the T-posts, doing one every four plants. So now let's do the weave. I'm gonna start pretty low here on these peppers, just a few inches off the ground, actually. Got my box of twine on my belt here on my hip. I'm not gonna use any weave wine today. I've been in the gym now for a couple months. Since I broke my back last summer, I'm feeling pretty limber. So I'm just gonna bend over and work along here and weave around these plants to get them supported. back to where we started here these peppers 
are easier to do than those tomatoes because we ain't got as much foliage to work around there. We can zip through there pretty quick. We'll just get this tied off here. We'll be good to go. So that's it. Nice and neat. Just like we did over there with those determinate tomatoes, except here we start our string a little closer to the ground. Now another option here, instead of doing the weave like we did, is just to kind of wrap around each segment of posts. So I've seen the commercial guys around here. There's a lot of commercial peppers grown here in South Georgia. And so what they'll do when they're planting on plastic, it looks like they've got their plants planted closer together than we do, which is on a two foot spacing. But they'll just take each segment of post and just run one line around the outside here instead of weaving in between each plant. If you've got time to weave between each plant, I think that does work better. But if you've got a really long stretch of rows, you can probably get by with just kind of wrapping around the outside and coming around the other side. And just as it is with those determinate tomatoes, in my opinion, the Florida weave is the cheapest and easiest way to trellis peppers. Even if you've just got four pepper plants in a raised bed, all you need is a couple T-posts and some twine, nothing fancy, and you can trellis them that way on a small scale, on a row or two scale like we have here, or on a scale of several acres. Now the only caveat to having that first string set so low like that is it makes it extremely difficult to weed between those plants. But I've got a solution for that. So we're gonna put a little bit of that right over there. That there looks pretty pretty if you ask me that to keep us from having to weed between there it took about four and a half bales of straw but that's going to save us a lot of time in the long run now you might be wondering or you might be thinking well isn't that pine straw going to make your soil more acidic i don't know maybe it does maybe it doesn't i've never really tested it i could see where it might but if you remember back from our soil tests all these plots here in the dream garden had a little bit of a high pH. So it's not gonna hurt anything if we increase the acidity of our soils a little bit right here. I can't tell by the things growing in here. If I wouldn't have tested, I would have never known that there was a high pH in this pot right here because those tomatoes are kicking butt. The peppers are looking good. Everything's doing great in here, regardless of what the pH is. And if you've been watching me garden for a while, you know I've never been a big fan of mulching in the garden, especially mulching annuals. There are some perennials we mulch, but I've never been a big fan of mulching annuals. But I've gotten to where I do more of it lately. I like mulching things with pine straw that are gonna be in the garden a long time. So for instance, that garlic I'm gonna show you in a minute, we put straw around it because it's in the garden for a very, very long time, six months out of the year maybe it's even seven these peppers are going to be in the ground a long long time we planted them about a month ago and they'll be here till november probably if they keep producing so putting that straw down there although it is an additional cost that we have to eat is going to save us a lot of time in the long run because we don't have to worry about weeding it now i'm not going to go all wood chip on you i'm not a fan of wood chips i don't like how if you get a heavy rain the wood chips can kind of go all over the place the pine straw kind of stays where you put it and i like the fact that when the grow out is done i can take my little hand blower or if i had a backpack blower and i can just blow it out on the grass and chew it up with the lawnmower we're not going to till the pine straw into the soil i guess you could but it's really easy to get rid of the pine straw after the grow out so now that those peppers are taken care of let's take care of these three torangina cherry tomato plants are in these cages here because these cages are kind of hard to weed underneath as well so we can put some straw underneath there kind of clean those up a little bit too and looky there we got three or four maters or as Tata calls them a matoes right there hopefully those will be turning pretty soon and we can see if this variety is worth the money now before we put some straw down here I need to clean these up a little bit and kind of move them up these rungs here if I can without breaking them too much. Kind of pull them in here. I probably should have did this a few days ago. Oh, 
I broke a piece right there, it'll be all right though. Chunk that. And I might need to prune the bottom of these a little bit just so we can get our straw around them. Try to keep some of those leaves from touching the soil there. Let's take that guy right there off. Get a few of these at the bottom. You could probably single stem this variety if you wanted to. It's supposed to be kind of like sun gold, just a little more of a compact plant. But when you're using these cages like this, you really don't want to single stem them. You want them to kind of bush out so the cage can kind of support the plant. Okay, that looks better right there. No leaves touching the ground now. We'll just put some straw, kind of just pack it in here around this cage so we don't have to worry about weeds in there. There we go. And we'll do those other two. And now all three of those look a lot better. Got them pruned at the bottom, got some straw in there. And I saw at least about seven or eight tomatoes between those three plants. So maybe we'll have something to taste test pretty soon. Now, I'm probably not gonna mulch or put straw around these determinants here because they produce so much foliage. We don't prune these and usually they kind of handle their own weed control just by shading out along the row there. So we usually don't have a whole lot of issues in there. So I'm not gonna worry about those. All right, so now let's check on our garlic here. So we've got seven rows of garlic, several different types and varieties. On the end here, we have three rows of elephant garlic, which we grow every year. We planted this from our own seed stock that we saved. That's looking pretty good. Probably needs a little water. And then here we have our soft neck garlic experiment, four different varieties. So these first two are artichoke types. These other two are silver skin types. So the first one we have here is Island Star. And then we've got Kettle River Giant, Mexican Red Silver, and then Nuke to Rose on the end. So we planted the elephant garlic back in November. Like we always do, we used our saved seed stock this year. The soft neck garlic, we ordered that online from Fillory Farms, and then we kept that in the fridge for eight, maybe even 10 weeks, I believe. And then we put that in the ground in December. And as you can see behind me here, we have pine straw over the entire garlic plot. And the reason we used the pine straw was twofold. So one obviously was for weed suppression. This stuff is in the ground a long time. We spent a little time, put some straw out there. We don't have to worry about keeping it weeded for those six or seven months when it's in the ground. But secondly, from what I've read, if you mulch around your garlic, it keeps the soil cooler longer into spring so as things are heating up right now we're going to start to see some 90 degree days pretty soon it will keep that soil cooler and the garlic won't go to seed as fast and even if you can extend that garlic growing window just a few weeks you can make significantly larger bulbs or at least that's what i read so far it seems to be working because i had someone that said they were a couple hours north of me and their elephant garlic was already bolting and usually ours would be bolting by now usually when we're harvesting onions we're starting to see some seed heads on the elephant garlic but no signs of seed heads yet which is telling me that the straw was working keeping the soil cool and hopefully that means we get some massive heads of elephant garlic and so the same thing kind of applies with the soft neck garlic. If we can keep that soil cooler for longer, we may actually get a decent harvest. Now I've grown elephant garlic for many years and I know we wait until it forms those seed heads or those scapes and then that's when we need to harvest it once it starts to die back after forming those seed heads. But with the soft neck garlic, it's a little bit of a different story. So from what I read, you want to look for some of the bottom leaves kind of dying back a little bit and you got to be a lot more timely harvesting the soft neck garlic than you do other types of garlic so i think one of the rows is starting to show some signs of death on the leaves so i want to take a look check it out see what we've got so if we take a closer look at this island star variety here we can start to see some leaves dying back on it we start to see a little bit of that on this kettle river giant here now i'm no soft neck garlic expert but it appears that these two artichoke types are maturing faster or they're starting to show signs of dying faster than the silver skin types maybe if some of you out there know you can help me out is that what i should be seeing or is that something unusual now i'm not going to harvest this entire row today but i do want to pull up some of this 
just to see what we got, see if we're close, and see if we do need to harvest it all pretty soon. I think I can just pull it up there. So that actually looks pretty good there. Now, sometimes it's hard to tell before it dries if you've got individual cloves, but I can feel there, and it surely does look like we got stratification and we've got cloves forming and that's a decent little size head of soft neck garlic from what i can remember when we planted these that's about the same clove size that we started with maybe a little bit bigger check this one out here oh yeah that's a nice one right there yeah and i can feel there we do indeed have individual cloves so it looks like we'll be harvesting this stuff really really soon and to that i say hot diggity dog and to that I say all right all right all right this is not supposed to be easy for us to do down here in the south where it doesn't get very cold the soft neck garlic likes cold temperatures to stratify and form those cloves but we followed some guidelines that we found online we put it in the fridge for two months we put the mulch around it we fed it well we had drip tape underneath there watered it well fertilized it well and it looks like we have succeeded and this stuff right here smells fabulous this stuff is supposed to have a little more flavor than elephant garlic a little more spicy than elephant garlic and if the smell is any sign i think it's going to be pretty good stuff so in the next few days i'll probably pull that entire row of island star might go ahead and pull that row of Kettle River Giant too because it's starting to look like the Island Star was looking. We're going to leave those two silver skin types in there because they're still looking pretty green and healthy. Maybe give those another week or two and then assess then. Now I told y'all I was going to talk about the figs and I am, but Ty Ty has got a soccer game here in a minute. So let me go do the soccer dad thing and then I'll come back and we'll talk about fig trees. All right, so I'm back from the soccer game, and that's about as thrilling as four-year-old soccer can get. Titus usually loses interest towards the end of the game, and he's picking at grass or leaves or whatever. It's funny because it's four-year-old soccer. It's co-ed, and the best player on our team is this girl, and she just scores all the goals. The rest of them are just kind of in la-la land by the end of the game, but it's a fun experience. So now let's talk about these figs. So the last few days I've been working on finishing out my little mini orchard here. I had a few gaps to fill. I was able to get my hands on a few new varieties that I didn't have. And then I also kind of multiplied a few of the varieties. Some of the varieties only had one or two trees, so I wanted to add a few more. That way I had a good stock of three to four trees per variety. So here's a tree we just planted, I think yesterday. And so we just came in here and added one of these little drip emitters to our main line that was already here. And this irrigation system is working wonderfully, saving me a ton of time as opposed to coming out here and watering all these trees by hand. All I got to do is plug in one of those emitters there, turn this system on, and I can keep all these trees nice and happy. And I can tell that this irrigation system is already making a big difference on those existing trees. They're a lot more green than they usually are. We've been feeding them some of the AgriThrive fruit and flower through the drip system, keeping them nice and happy and stress-free. And I know that these little yellow tags that I got off Amazon are probably going to get brittle in the sun and fade over time, and they're not going to last forever, but I sure do like the way it looks being able to walk by the tree I can easily see which variety it is and I don't know just visually appealing to me more than a limb tag so after I filled in all the gaps in my orchard we've got about 90 trees here left about eight different varieties that we can share with you guys so here's how this is going to work these are the trees right here in these tall skinny pots they've been growing for a while in the greenhouse most of them have a pretty nice root system as you can see there so we've got about eight different varieties let me see if i can remember them all we've got canadria improved celeste mary lane seedless Janeri, olympian black malta lsu tiger lsu gold i think that's eight we don't have the same amount for every variety and like i said we've only got 90 trees here so when they're gone they're gone so if you go 
to the page for a particular variety that says out of stock, it's out of stock. So if you're watching on YouTube, I'll put a link in the description below. If you're not watching on YouTube, if you're watching on Facebook or whatever, you can just go to our website, lazydogfarm.com, and you'll see the figs there. You'll see pictures of what the actual figs look like for each of the eight varieties, and we'll also have descriptions for each variety. So each tree, regardless of variety, is going to be $45, and that includes shipping, so it's free shipping on all of these. I've looked around online, a bunch of different places, and these live fig trees like this are going from anywhere from $40 a piece to $80 a piece plus shipping, so I figured $45 include the shipping was a fair price for these, and you get a nice fig tree that's ready to go in the ground and should take off growing pretty well. Now due to live plant shipping restrictions between states, we can't ship these everywhere. So let me give you the states where we can ship these. So of course, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Virginia, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, Missouri, West Virginia, and Kentucky. Now, if you don't live in one of those states and you add one of these trees to the shopping cart on our website and try to check out with your address not in one of these states, it's not going to let you check out. So your address, your shipping address has to be in one of these states to be able to order one of these trees. And while some varieties of figs are a little more cold hardier than others, just know if you live in Kansas, Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, any of those states where it can get kind of cold, if it gets down in the low 20s, you're going to need to cover these trees. So be prepared to do that if you purchase one and plant it in those states. And for those of you that do decide to order, let me show you what it's going to look like when this thing arrives at your doorstep. So these are going to be shipping via the U.S. Postal Service, and they're going to come in a box like this, kind of a tall rectangular box. If you order multiple trees, they will be delivered in multiple boxes. We're not going to wrap boxes together so each tree will be in its own individual box on the box we've got these live plant stickers that hopefully tell the postal people to keep it upright but we're doing some things inside the box to kind of make sure it doesn't move around this little tag right here is all our certifications from the state so we can do interstate shipping so when you get this box in the mail when you go to open it don't try to open it from the top there's going to be a little notch that's cut in this box right here. That notch will be covered with tape. But there'll be a little notch right here that's going to keep that plant from moving up and down. So the easiest way to open this is to cut open the bottom and then the tree should slide right out the bottom. If you open it from the top and try to pull it out, that little notch is going to keep you from being able to pull it out the top. So open it from the bottom and kind of pull it out that way. Once you get your tree out of the box, it's going to have this little piece of cardboard wrapped around the stem there. That's what we use to keep the soil from going everywhere inside the box. So just carefully take that off. And I would recommend not planting this immediately when you receive it. These plants are going to be fine in that box for a few days as they travel from my place to yours. But they might be a little bit stressed. So I would say water this thing, baby it for a week or so. You know, water it regularly, water it once a day, kind of get it back to full strength, and then put it in the ground. Now, if you've got an irrigation system set up like we do, that's great. If not, you're going to have to hand water these when you plant them in the ground. And when you plant them, just plant that root ball, just kind of level with the ground. No need to plant them any deeper than that. But if you're going to be hand watering them, as is the case with pretty much all fruit trees, it's a good idea to kind of make you a little indention here around the plant kind of a little furrow or a little circle all the way around the plant that's going to help kind of hold water in the hole there so it's not running all over the place so if you are hand watering do that make you a little furrow there to hold the water in place and you're probably gonna have to water this thing at least once every two days if not every day until it gets a good root system established in the soil there now these trees do take us a little longer to box up and ship than say something like a hat or a t-shirt. We're going to try to get them out as fast as we can. I hope to be able to get them all out this week. We're going to ship as many as we can per day and get them out as fast as we can. But we might not get them shipped out the exact day you place an order. 
So for those of you who have been waiting patiently for these to be available, I hope you're able to get one. I do think they're going to go fast. I wouldn't wait around too long. Like I said, we've only got 90 trees or so this year. This is something I've been working on for about three years now, and it's kind of a dream of mine that's finally coming true. We were able to do around 100 plants this year. If this works out this year, hopefully next year we can do somewhere between 500 and 1,000 plants and just keep growing this thing. And in addition to the fig trees being on the website, when this video airs, I'll also have a blog on the website giving you kind of the breakdown of our fruit tree or fig irrigation system that we installed several videos ago. We also now have an affiliate partnership with Drip Depot. So if you're watching on YouTube, we've got an affiliate link below for Drip Depot. And if you order any drip supplies from them, we'd appreciate it. If you use our link there, we'll have those links on that blog as well. So we appreciate everybody's patience on getting these things ready to ship. We got kind of held up with all the certifications and stuff. We know the drill now. Next year, it'll be a lot easier and we'll be prepared to ship these things sooner. So I hope you enjoyed the video today. A lot going on around here. And let me know what you think about my soft neck garlic harvest there, or at least the two that we pulled up. If you've grown soft neck garlic before, let me know what you think about that bulb. Is that a good sized bulb or is that just a puny bulb and I've got some work to do? And if you did enjoy the video, make sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like and share, and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm.